Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here right before the holidays. We appreciate your time and effort to be here. Um, for those who are coming uh, for the first time uh, to Crick's events, uh, I would like to introduce a little bit what we are trying to do. Uh, Kirk is a very fresh uh, research-based participatory and critical initiative that comes as a response to the shrinking of individual cultural and political spheres in Turkey in the past decade. Um, while several collectives and solidarity organizations which we were part of struggle to sustain themselves, uh, larger, larger cultural institutions had to make concessions from programs that define their long-term missions. Um, seeking comfort in actions of immediate solidarity and togetherness against oppression resulted in gathering only around certain defense lines. So we are trying to propose to focus on what this emphasis on solidarity has been missing and uh, we wanted to expand beyond defense lines to activate discussions which remain in the cracks. The inspiration of our name also comes from this. By choosing Kruk as the name of our initiative, we embrace and reclaim multiple meanings of this uh, versatile word in Turkish, such as crack, broken, hue, hybrid, fault, strange, queer, and bent. Um, today, Kruk talks continue with a discussion on amateur librarianship and mass disobedience against intellectual property. We wanted to host this talk because in a country like Turkey where academics, uh, the ties of the academics to the universities are forcefully cut because of the current political situation. We believe discussing this issue uh, has a crucial importance. Today we have Tomislav Medak. Unfortunately, Marcel Mars couldn't be with us because of a health uh, situation in his family. So welcome Tomislav. Um, I would like to briefly introduce um, Tomislav. Uh, Tomislav Medak is a doctoral student at the Center of Post-Digital Cultures at Coventry University. Medak is a member of the theory and publishing team of the Multimedia East Institute, MIMI in Zagreb, as well as an amateurian libra librarian for the Memory of the World public library project. His research focuses on technologies, capitalist development, and post-capitalist transition, particularly on economies of intellectual property and unevenness of technoscience. Together with Marcel Mars, he co-edited Public Library and Guerrilla Open Access. And together with Valeria Graziano, Mars and Medak are uh, conveners of the Pirate Care Project. Welcome again, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Zeyna. Uh, thank you, Kukin, and uh, thank you, Krik, uh, for organizing this evening's uh, event and inviting me to present or inviting, inviting uh, Marcel and myself. The sound is very low, Thomas. Ah, it's again low. It's so really just... low. Yeah. My computer keeps behaving. How is it now? It's the same. The same. Is this any better? Yeah, I'm much better, yeah. Okay, let's hope if it again goes down, just let me know. Okay. Uh, I don't know, uh, my computer is acting up uh, something with uh, microphone uh, levels. Um, so um, I'd like to thank for the invitation on, on Marcel's behalf and my behalf. Uh, as Zeno said, unfortunately, uh, he couldn't be uh, with us this evening. His kid is in the hospital and uh, something post-COVID. Uh, and uh, he was just uh, not available for this evening. But um, anyhow, uh, what I wanted to say regardless of that is that I'm really sorry that uh, I can't be uh, in Turkey, uh, in Istanbul with you. It's been such a long while since I've been there. Um, I, re I recall meeting uh, Zeyno for the first time um, in Warsaw and she was um, sort of highlighting the fact that uh, since um, sort of uh, Turkey, uh, went in, in sort of authoritarian direction that everybody has 
um, bypassed uh, Turkey, who was coming there on a regular basis. Uh, I had sort of a theater career prior to that, and we performed once or twice in Istanbul. And uh, I really, really uh, miss Istanbul and, and Turkey uh, so much. So I hope that there will be soon um, sort of an opportunity and that the circumstances will allow again for travel and uh, return to Turkey, uh, meeting you in, in uh, a live situation, in-person situation and, and uh, sort of um, figuring uh, things out uh, up close, you know, what's happening politically, what's happening socially. It's been such a long while and I feel uh, far from informed, so I can't really speak to to the current Turkish situation, do any justice uh, to the predicament that uh, Zeno has pointed to of uh, being uh, of many people from academia being shut out from the institution and uh, relatedly from institutional uh, access to uh, knowledge. In any case, um, in tonight's talk, um, I will uh, discuss sort of the, the background story uh, of memory of the world of the shadow library or pirate library that uh, Marcel and I uh, maintain and um, um, work on bringing together librarians who work on the collections. Uh, so um, it's a story more about uh, access, uh, politics of access, political economy of access to knowledge, uh, but also the story of uh, public library as uh, a situation, uh, as a, an institution that emerged uh, out of uh, 19th century modernization, I'll go, as I'll go more into the detail, uh, in Europe and sort of became the central institution of uh, organizing, classifying, and in a way, uh, producing and reproducing uh, knowledge, which includes uh, access. And then uh, to finish off, uh, I'll, I'll uh, discuss more about uh, memory uh, of the world as, as a project itself uh, and its uh, specific, uh, I guess, mode of operating and also politics. Okay, I'll, I'll be running, um, a slideshow uh, in the background, which will be more evocative uh, uh, as I'll be reading for the greater part of my presentation, uh, just to keep uh, your senses a little bit uh, busy from, from um, sort of the monotony of, of my talk. Uh, oh, let's hope it's not that monotonous. <clears throat> On 14th of August 2012, the premises of Rameshwari photocopy services in Delhi were raided by the order of the Delhi High Court. Following a petition for copyright infringement that Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, and Taylor's, Taylor and Francis had filed against the photocopy shop and the Delhi University. Rameshwari had been tasked by the Delhi School of Economics to produce course packs consisting of photocopied excerpts from copyright protected works sold to students at 0.4 rupee per page, making these teaching materials affordable to Indian students of modest means. The case concerned the scope of copyright ex exception for education under the Indian Copyright Act, allowing quote, uh, unquote, reproduction of any work by a teacher or a pupil in the course of instruction. The publishers insisted on a narrow interpretation of this exception that would have severely limited the capacity to reproduce and access teaching materials. Delhi University, supported by the Society for Promoting Educational Access and Knowledge and the Association of Students for Equitable Access to Knowledge, argued that such an interpretation risked limiting the constitutional right to education and the attendant, attendant right of access to knowledge, thus deepening inequalities in a society riven by divisions of caste and class and a global system of education characterized by huge economic disparities between academic communities. 
the legal case sparked massive protests by students and academics who took to the streets across India and engaged in acts of civil disobedience. And finally, in an unprecedented decision four years later, the Delhi High Court ruled against the publishers, against the tendency to interpret copyright as a right of exclusion, benefiting the private interest of entities mostly located in the global north and in favor of the public right to uh, equitable access to knowledge. In 2015, uh, Elsevier, the largest academic publisher, commercial academic publisher in the world, uh, filed a copyright infringement suit in New York against Science Hub and Library Genesis, claiming millions of dollars in damages. This has come as a big blow, not just to the administrators of the websites, but also to thousands of researchers around the world for whom these sites are the only viable source of academic materials. The social media mailing lists and IRC channels have been filled with their distress messages, desperately seeking articles and publications. In Elsevier's case against Science Hub and Library Genesis, the judge said, quote unquote, simply making copyrighted content available for free via, via a foreign website, this serves the public interest. And in response to that, Alexandria Albakian, the administrator of Science Hub, uh, pled uh, putting the stakes much higher, quote unquote, if Elsevier manages to shut down our projects or force them into the dark net, that will demonstrate an important idea that the public does not have the right to knowledge. In a dialectical turn of events, uh, very recently, uh, last year, Elsevier, this year, in fact, uh, Elsevier has decided to sue Science Hub again, but, but this time in a Delhi court to prevent access to the site in India. And Alexandra Aldakian has again decided to stand up and defend her project and its cause in the court. Given that this is an Indian court where public interest has frequently trumped the global intellectual property enforcement, we are keenly awaiting the court's decision. It may have sort of uh, significant repercussions. Uh, but to give a full relief of the significance of the continued operation of Science Hub, which probably won't be endangered no matter the decision of the court, we need to look at the asymmetries in the global higher education in more general terms. The world of higher education and science is structured by uneven development. The world's top ranked universities are concentrated in a dozen rich countries. Um, here you can see in the bank background, uh, the famous ranking of the Times Higher Education, there are many. Um, and these uh, dozen rich countries command most of the global investment into higher education and research. The oligopoly of commercial academic publishers is headquartered in no more than half of those countries. The excessive rise of subscription fees has made it prohibitively expensive even for the richest universities, uh, university libraries of the global north to provide access to all the journals they would need to drawing protests from academics all over the world against the outrageous high prices, tag, high prices tags that Reed Elsevier puts on, on um, the journals it publishes. Against this concentration of economic might and exclusivity of access stands the fact that the rest of the world has little access to the top ranked uh, research universities, though one shouldn't overstate uh, the the import of, of sort of uh, top ranking universities, but nonetheless, and that the poor universities are left with no option, but to tacitly encourage their students to use shadow libraries. And this is pretty much what the current, uh, the current case in uh, the Delhi court really re revolves around. Furthermore, over the last three uh, decades, processes have been a number of processes have been transforming the global knowledge factory. Firstly, higher education has been subjected to the processes of neoliberalization, marked by a reduction in public funding, which has made 
contingent upon economic achievement of the universities, by precarious academic labor arrangements, and by introduction or even rising uh, student, student fees. Secondly, universities have been pushed to constantly create trendy programs, follow the imperative of publish or perish, perform and assess, hire and fire, find new sources of funder, funding, find students, find, find interest of parents, vie for public attention, produce evidence of immediate impact. These are all short-term strategies modeled on the quick extraction of value that Wendy Brown calls the financialization of everything. However, the best in the game of such quick rent seeking are as always those universities that carry most prestige, that have the most assets and that need to be least afraid for their future. Whereas the rest, the rest of the universities are simply struggling in the prospect of reduced funding. Thirdly, in the knowledge economies of the capitalist core, employability or the cause, the imperative of employability predominates, preening human capital for the labor market. Uh, on the opposite, in the knowledge economies of the capitalist periphery, states, states are neither able to capture the value of human capital nor the value of innovation but they are just forced to compete in the unequal exchange of the world economy by cheapening the price of labor and the price of natural resources. They have little use and employment opportunities for high, highly skilled labor. Just to give you an example, um, a friend researcher, um, she is currently the vice mayor of uh, the city of Zagreb, Daniela Dolenets, in her uh, sort of previous academic uh, career, has also researched into the economies of higher education. And she has looked uh, more concretely at uh, the economies of higher education in, in the Western Balkans. Uh, and in a study, she writes the whole region of Western Balkans invests approximately. 495 million euros in research and development annually per year, which is equivalent of one uh, second largest, I assume that would be Stanford uh, US University. Current levels of investment cannot have a meaningful impact on the current model uh, of econ economic development. The, the editorial director of global rankings at Times Higher Education, Phil Beatty, uh, minces no words when he bluntly states, quote unquote, that money talks in global higher education seems to be self-evident. Uneven economic development reinforces global, un global uneven development in higher education and science, and vice versa. It is in the face of this combined economic and educational unevenness that library genesis and science have two repositories for a decommodified access to otherwise paywalled uh, journals and, and books attain a particular import for students, academics, and researchers worldwide. And it is in the face of combined economic and educational unevenness that library genesis uh, and science hub continue to brave the core decisions, continuously changing their domains, securing ways of access beyond the World Wide Web, and ensuring robust redundancy of the materials in their repositories, primarily by creating mirrors. I have so far commented mostly on, on higher education institutions, uh, that is universities, but uh, the, the problematic of access is uh, fundamentally uh, entwined with the history of libraries. And I would now like to look at the sort of destiny of libraries uh, and the destiny that libraries have uh, created for uh, public access uh, to knowledge, sort of universal access to knowledge. Um, though we can discuss the, the notion of universality maybe later, but uh, let's put it just out there. Um, Library is an institution of public access and popular literacy did not develop before a series of transformations and social upheavals unfolded during the course of the 18th and the 19th century. These developments brought about a flood of books and political demands 
pushing the library to become embedded in an egalitarian, free and democratizing political horizon. The historical backdrop for these developments was the rapid ascendancy of the book as a mass commodity and the growing importance of the reading culture in the aftermath of the invention of the movable typeprint. Having emerged almost in peril with capitalism, by the early 18th century, the trade in books was rapidly expanding. While in the 15th century, the libraries around the monasteries, uh, courts and universities of Western Europe contained no more than 5 million volumes of manuscripts. In the 18th century, only the output of printing press presses exploded to 700 millions, million volumes. And while this provided a vector for the emergence of a bourgeois reading public and an unprecedented expansion of modern science, the culture of reading and enlightenment remained largely a privilege of the few. Two upheavals would start to change that. First was, was the decision of the French Revolutionary National Assembly from November 2nd, 1789, to seize all book collections from the church and aristocracy. Millions of volumes were transferred to the Bibliothèque Nationale and local libraries across France. In peril, particularly in England, capitalism was on the rise. It massively displaced the impoverished rural population into grown urban centers, propelled the development of industrial production, and by the mid 19th century, introduced the steam powered rotary press into the book business. As books became more easily and mass produced, the commercial subscription libraries catering to the better off parts of the society blossomed. This brought the class aspect of the nascent demand for public access to books to the, to the fore. After the failed attempts to introduce universal suffrage and end the system of political representation based on uh, property entitlements in 1830s and 1840s, the English Chartist movement started to open reading rooms and cooperative lending libraries that would kick quickly become a popular hotbed of social exchanges between the lower classes. In the aftermath of the revolutionary upheavals of 1848, the fearful ruling classes heeded the demand for tax financed public libraries, hoping that the access to literature and edification would ultimately hegemonize the working class for the benefits of capitalism's culture of self-interest and uh, competition. It's no surprise that the Chartist, reeling from a political defeat of the Reform Act of 1832, have started to open reading rooms and cooperative lending libraries. The education provided to the proletariat and the poor by the ruling, uh, sorry, uh, let me do this again. The education provided to the proletariat and the poor by the ruling classes of the time consisted either of a pious moral edification serving political pacification or of an incalculation of the skills and knowledge useful to the factory owners. Even the seemingly noble efforts of society for the diffusion of the useful knowledge, a Whig organization aimed at bringing highbrow learning to the middle and working classes in the form of simplified and expensive publications were aimed at dulling the edge of radicalism of popular movements. These efforts to pacify the down, downtrodden masses push, uh, push them to seek ways of self-organized education that would provide them with literacy and really, and really useful knowledge, not applied, but critical knowledge that would allow them to see through their own political and economic subjection, develop radical politics, and innovate shadow social institutions of their own. The radical ed education, reliant on meager resources and time of the working class, lacking develop, uh, uh, developed in the informal setting of household, neighborhood, and workplace, but also through radical press and communal reading and discussion groups. The demand for a really useful knowledge encompassed a critique of all forms of provided education and of the liberal conception that national education was a necessary condition for the granting of universal su suffrage. Development of radical curricula and pedagogies 
formed a part of the arsenal of political strategy as a means of changing the world. Now fast forwarding into 1960s. The library field started to call into question the merit of objectivity and neutrality that the librarianship embraced in the 1920s with its induction into the status of science. In the context of social up upheavals of the 1960s and the 1970s, the librarians started to question the myth of libra library neutrality. With the transition to a knowledge economy and transformation of the information into a commodity, librarians could no longer ignore that the neutrality had the effect of perpetuating the implicit structural exclusions of class, gender, and race, and that they themselves uh, were the gatekeepers of epistemic and material privilege. The egalitarian politics inscribed into public libraries' DNA already through their decommodifying decommodifying mission started to trump uh, neutrality. Thus libraries came to acknowledge their commitment to the marginalized, their pedagogies and their struggles. However, the economic developments of the last couple of decades have created conditions for public libraries that have largely overturned that reorientation toward socializing knowledge. Two years ago, we have learned from Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy's annual survey of the UK's libraries, that in the UK over the last decade of the conservative-led governments, no less than 773 out of total 4,356 library branches have been closed. That the spending of libraries uh, on libraries has declined by 30%, that the number of salaried staff has gone from 24,000 to 15,000, and that visits have dropped at a, accordingly from 315 million to 226 million. Much of that decline has come as a consequence of the reduction of funding for local councils that had no choice but to direct their modest means toward quote unquote priority services such as social care. Libraries have thus been subjected to brutal cuts, affecting their ability to stay open, service their communities, and in particular, the marginalized groups and children. Just as the universities, libraries have thus seen their capacity to address structural e exclusions of marginalized groups and provide support to those affected by uh, precarity compromised. This has resulted in a situation where public libraries find themselves now struggling to provide legitimation for the support they receive. So they reinvent and rebrand themselves as a third place of socialization for the elderly and the youth, spaces where the unemployed can find assistance with their job applications, the socially marginalized a public location with no economic pressures to spend money. All these functions, however, are nothing that public libraries didn't do before, along with what was their primary function, providing universal access to all written knowledge, uh, at both of which they are, however, nowadays in the neoliberal digital economy, severely limited. Let's now turn to that digital uh, economy, neoliberal digital economy. Digital access has expanded the quantity of available texts uh, exponentially. Oh, sorry, let me take that. Digital access has expanded the quantity of available texts exponentially since the days of print. A collection of 150,000 electronic books can fit on a hard drive. The largest of collectively run shadow libraries uh, provides access to some 2 million books, while Google Books allows search but not access to around 40 million books. Well, a transition to digital has provided opportunities to reconsider how societies produce, sustain, and make available written culture and science, that is to socialize those forms of production, vested commercial interest in combination with a property form that treats intellectual creation as if it were a piece of land, have created insurmountable barriers to a transformation of our systems of cultural and knowledge production. 
out of these processes of transformation, public libraries have emerged worse off than where, than where they were two, three decades ago, before we have entered the digital age. In many ways, libraries were at the outside, uh, at the outset of the computer age, uh, at, the, at the origin of computing. Library science expanded and became enmeshed within information science uh, throughout the 20th century, particularly in the second half. The capacity to aggregate, organize, and classify huge bodies of information, to view it as an interlinked mesh of references indexed in a card catalog, set well within the developments in the computer world. Though this was, these were the inventions of the library. In return, the expansion of access to knowledge that the new computer networks promised fell in line with the promise of public libraries that everybody would get the commodified access to uh, knowledge and culture. However, this synergy has unfolded much to the detriment of public libraries. Until relatively recently, libraries didn't have right to purchase ebooks for lending and preservation. In the background, you can see a letter from American Library Association from 2012 complaining that large publishers are preventing them from uh, lending digital books. And even when they are allowed to uh, lend digital books, there is only a limited number of uh, lendings they could do before the copies are destroyed, they can't preserve the copies, and so on and so forth. Um, this, ha this has changed a little bit in some places. In Croatia, it still didn't. You know, libraries don't, public libraries don't uh, lend uh, digital books, but uh, uh, in the US and some other places, I guess, uh, this is changing. But uh, all the way until uh, mid last decade, that was definitely not the case. Furthermore, with the academic journals, it's even worse. As the journals moved to predominantly digital models of distribution and have thus been able to streamline their costs, libraries could provide access to publishers' service and preserve the journals only for as long as they continued paying skyrocketing prices for subscriptions. In the background, you see uh, data uh, produced by the British Parliament uh, that uh, charts the rise in um, subscription expenditures um, against uh, sort of the inflation uh, index. And you can see that they were rising 300% uh, over uh, the, the inflation index over, over the last uh, sort of, uh, well, it goes until 2010, so over like three decades. It is out of this denial of decommodified access to digital books, denial of providing uh, decommodified access to digital uh, books, that the readers start to public libraries, that the readers started to digitize and share texts on their own. To facilitate they sh that sharing, they went on to create venues such as hashtag I can has PDF or to these days in, in Facebook, you can find uh, ask for PDFs from people with institutional access, huge sort of uh, groups uh, that uh, have organized the sharing of texts or to create infrastructures for sharing that we can understand as true shadow libraries, providing the decommodified access that is denied to public libraries. Shadow libraries are in that sense complement uh, to public libraries. They, they do in the world of digital what uh, public libraries were able in the world of print. And uh, many such infrastructures have arisen uh, over time. Uh, many were shut down. Uh, one of the earliest, earliest ones that I remember is text.com that was run by uh, a Berlin artist, Sebastian Lutgart, um, that was uh, shut down by the Adorno Estate and the Hamburg Institute for Social uh, Research, uh, who are the holders of uh, Adorno's estate or cares of Adorno's estate. 
Uh, but sort of the big impacting uh, closure was the closure in 2011 or yeah, 2011 of library.new, um, which some of you might uh, recall using. Um, it was uh, shut down um, as it was, uh, I think, headquartered in, in Ireland. Uh, sort of copyright, copyright enforcement bodies got whiff where they are whiff of where they are based, and they shut them down. And in that moment, there was a vacuum of access. Uh, I recall that colleagues uh, twenty years younger than me who were studying. Uh, say at the uh, School of Arts and Humanities here in Zagreb, they're all panicked uh, where they are going to find access next. And this is basically what pushed many to start building alternative infrastructures, including us, memory of the world emerged out of, uh, of, out of that moment. Uh, but here I would like quickly to take you through a couple of uh, shadow libraries um from the smaller to the larger ones that you might find useful i'm sure that most of you will know most of them so i'll just run quickly through through them um i have them here open as uh web pages so let me just uh, load them this is monoscope monoscope is uh, a wiki documenting uh, avant-garde and media art uh, initially across Eastern Europe. Uh, so historic avant-garde and uh, contemporary avant-garde and media art uh, across Eastern Europe and then becoming more comprehensive. Uh, it's primarily an archivist project uh, run by uh, Dusan Barok, uh, who's certainly the most uh, sort of epitomic archivist I have ever uh, met. Uh, he kind of keeps track of uh, many sort of sources of information and, and many bits of uh, information uh, on Monoscope. You'll find many biographies of artists, mapping of uh, cultural scenes across many places, uh, including Zagreb. That's how I met Dushan. Um, uh, but also immense collections uh, related to uh, specific topics like Anthropocene or uh, architecture. Um, also, you'll find uh, many journals of the histor uh, histor historical avant-garde that Dushan went uh, to sort of various uh, uh, archives to digitize or pulled uh, existing images to, to just put them together. So that's, that's primarily what Monoscope does, but it also has a blog where it features a lot of uh, uh, contemporary and historical uh, works in, in the field uh, that uh, Dushan is interested in and that sort of fall you know, within the remit of uh, Monoscope's interest. Um, so you can find it at monoscope.org slash blog. Next one up is ubu.com. Uh, ubu.com is a project of an American uh, conceptual poet and artist, Kenneth Goldsmith, uh, who, um, well, uh, in 1996, just started creating a website with links to works, uh, first uh, creating uh, archives of concrete poetry and then moving on to various other uh, genres and fields of uh, contemporary art. It has around 100,000 uh, works and all that was compiled uh, by a single person sitting down each evening and uh, creating this website, which is still written in HTML 1.0. So the oldest HTML specification, really low tech, but serving its purpose for us. It, this is the sort of the epitome of resilience. Uh, no need for databases or fancy um, server infrastructures. It's just that. Um, further, 
uh, to go further, it's ARG but fail um, project that was initiated as sort of a repository of texts for the project Public School, both in uh, both created by uh, Sean Docre. Uh, it's a huge community of hundred thousand uh, people and some hundred thousand items. It has um, discussion boards and it has uh, curated collections. Um, really sort of focused on, on uh, education. Uh, it's no longer being developed, but you can upload texts and you can, uh, so maybe there's less action going on there, uh, but it's uh, it used to be a sort of highly uh, interactive uh, place of knowledge production. Uh, going further, Library Genesis, I'm sure we are all familiar with Library Genesis, is the sort of largest shadow library that emerged out of the closing of library.new in 2011. Uh, a lot of a large part of the library new collection got merged with library genesis, but library genesis also has uh, inter an interesting history that uh, Hungarian Dutch researcher Bo Balas Bodo has written about uh, scientists, uh, in the 80s in the US, uh, in the USSR had very limited uh, access to photocopiers. So as soon as the computers were available, uh, they go down to transcribing in ASCII, so sort of in plain text, uh, works of um, first science fiction and then other uh, literary and academic works. Uh, there was a famous CD, Harifan CD, where, through which these uh, texts were disseminated. So there was sort of a culture of sharing prior to uh, the rise of the World Wide Web and uh, sharing in uh, digital networks, uh, but rather sharing through so-called sneaker nets. So uh, um, sending around uh, CDs and discs. Um, and out of that uh, sort of grew um, the context that maintains uh, library genesis. Um, it's maintained mostly by a community of Russian scientists uh, from, from what we know. And uh, it's done in a resilient way in the sense that it, uh, when they were creating library genesis, they created both the website its database and the entire collection so that they could be downloaded. Uh, this is the reason that Library Genesis um, has many mirrors. Uh, one mirror that claims sort of to be a website of its own and larger than Library Genesis is also Z Library, but uh, there are uh, many others. And this has created sort of uh, an ecosystem of mirroring uh, and, and resilience uh, in, in shadow libraries. And finally, there is Science Hub, which is um, at its face, uh, uh, a search engine for academic uh, journals and articles, uh, papers, uh, but also it's a repository. So every time you search for a new journal, it gets cached. And uh, it is assumed that around 80% of uh, all paywalled articles are uh, available through Science Hub. Um, okay, this sort of completes my quick uh, journey through shadow libraries uh, to come to, to uh, our own. So what you see in the background is memory of the world. So let me just tell you uh, quickly a story of memory of the world. Um, in 2012, uh, so just immediately after the closure of library.new, we launched a project under the name of Public Library. It was the 2012 iteration of the biannual New Media Festival Hype, and we were the curators of that New Media fe Festival. First, we had to convince the main organizers that we wanted to launch a public library instead of doing a festival, and we succeeded. Then we had to convince the rest of the world that what we launched was indeed a public library. In Ljubljana, we had a million of books in the room. If you would look around, you would not see the bookshelves, only the drawings of the bookshelves on the wall with the outlines of the spines of the books and QR codes instead of the titles and the authors. 
The download of any of the books was almost instantaneous using the QR code. Instantaneous because we had a server in there in Kibra Pipa where 11 terabytes of hard disks with a whole collection of a million of books from then a million of books from Library Genesis uh, was stored. We were downloading those books for more than a month before the launch. Library Genesis was the first book piracy website uh, which offered uh, their whole catalog to be easily downloaded as I just recounted. A million books on a server in the same room was very convincing for those who doubted that there is a public library in that space. Um, it had its public program, the public library, uh, books to read, uh, its patrons, visitors, and its librarians. During the same event, we launched our proof of concept uh, following, the following, following this definition of public library. Public library is, I have that written maybe for you, easier for you to follow here. Oops, no. So public library uh, is constituted by universal access to book, books for every member of a society, uh, by a library catalog that sort of organizes uh, that collection uh, of books that is uh, available to everyone, every member in this, of the society, and a librarian who in a way knows more uh, or has a thicker knowledge of uh, the collection than uh, the catalog itself. Um, we launched our public library uh, with a slogan, with books ready to be shared, meticulously cataloged, everyone is a librarian. When everyone is a librarian, library is everywhere. We imagined that today everyone could easily become an amateur librarian. An amateur librarian takes care of the book catalog and together with other amateur librarians, runs a collective public library. Something we maintain, this is something that we've been maintaining and running uh, at Memory of the World, library.memoryoftheworld.org uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, you can see here that we have a number of librarians, around 20 librarians. Uh, some of them are conceptual uh, figures. Some of them are uh, pseudonymous uh, librarians. Um, uh, only Marcel is there with his name. Um, and each book, has its metadata um, that constitutes uh, a catalog in the end. So we view our, our project, we, we initially called it public library. We no longer call, call it public library because we thought this definition applies to basically all shadow libraries and all uh, public libraries, historical public libraries that are uh, really existing public libraries outside of the world digital. Uh, and we have renamed it Memory of the World. Memory of the World is, uh, it's again an appropriation. Uh, it's a project by UNESCO uh, that purports as its mission to uh, provide access to the most valuable, intangible uh, heritage to the entirety of humanity. And because copyright is limiting their capacity in doing so, we have taken on that task. That's, that's kind of a simple explanation uh, behind um, what we do. So um, librarians take care of different collections uh, uh, on memory of the world. Uh, I will just show you a couple of uh, collections uh, that we have created. We do a lot of work. So maybe just to say this. So in 2012, when Library New was shut down, Marcel started uh, to work on a topology of sharing books via peer-to-peer -peer, uh, structure. And he designed uh, Memory of the World to be a peering structure of librarians. You know, librarians come together to share their collections uh, which sit on their computer. All they have to do is use Calibre, which is this free software um, 
collection manager uh, application uh, where you can enter metadata for each uh, digital book. Uh, and basically you can share the, that collection to the local network. So Marcel created an, an extension to uh, Calibre so that you could share the books directly to the open uh, internet. So you could connect directly to uh, somebody else's instance of Calibre or later to our central website where you basically uh, are accessing the books of others. And some of these collections are also on our server. So it's uh, one of the many librarians sharing. Uh, so other than that, uh, we've been also digitizing um, many collections. We've, uh, I think that in the announcement, there was a scanner image. Um, and this is our scanner uh, that we've been creating. We've created around 12 scanners uh, strewn around the world. But the one being used most, they seem like an aesthetic, nice aesthetic object. So people want to, us to create uh, scanners. Not many get used. But the one that really gets used is the one in Zagreb. And we've been working at uh, doing political interventions, uh, interventions into politics of memory. Um, so uh, one intervention was digitizing the archive of the Praxis Journal. It was a journal published between 1963 and 1973 in Zagreb and Belgrade and was um, sort of the foremost journal of uh, humanist Marxism at, at the time. It also organized a summer school at the island of Korchula and it was uh, sort of a location in, in the geopolitical arena of the Cold War where people from the East and West could meet. So most prominent uh, people from uh, the Frankfurt School were there, but also people from across Eastern Europe as well. And um, it has sort of its significance, but in the 90s, it was fully forgotten and in many instances repressed because already in the 70s, it was opposing nationalism, the rising nationalism. Um, and what we did is that we principally digitized an archive. Another person, uh, Ante Lushaya, has uh, created his sort of unofficial arch archivist of the Kochula Summer School and the Praxis Journal. Uh, another such intervention that we did um, is uh, a smaller collection of around 100 books um, that uh, composed the dream library of Herman Wallace who was a, a Black Panther uh, convicted to life uh, time in solitary, uh, solitary confinement. And then a US artist, Jackie Samuel, asked him uh, a couple of years before he passed away, what would be his dream house? And she went on to build that dream house in New Orleans. But as part of that, she asked him, what would be the dream library in that? Dream House, and uh, she was doing this project at Academie Schloss Solitude, and they managed to get the entire collection of 100 books that sort of uh, were sources of his political radicalization while in prison uh, there, but they were kept behind uh, an image, uh, sort of a cardboard that had the image of back spines of those books. So they weren't accessible. And then we decided uh, in agreement with uh, Jackie uh, to digitize them. And um, so it's called Herman Wallace's library. Uh, another such intervention is uh, the written off. So in early 1990s in Croatia, uh, some librarians in public libraries across uh, uh, Croatia uh, took the liberty of massively removing books from uh, from libraries, books that were in Cyrillic by Serbian authors, by uh, authors from other uh, Yugoslav uh, republics, uh, books that were dealing with socialism, uh, Second World War resistance movement. Um, so on the 20th occasion of a military action, uh, uh, the storm, which in 1995 caused around 500,000 Croatian Serbs to leave uh, Croatia, most of whom would never return. Um, and that 20th anniversary was celebrated by the state with a huge military parade. We decided to 
uh, organize a public scanning uh, intervention together with what, how, and for whom a curatorial collective uh, from Zagreb nowadays are also working in Vienna um, to kind of create a different uh, uh, politics of memory, uh, politics that um, destroyed many uh, monuments, public monuments documenting World War II, um, Second World War resistance, but also that expunged books from the library. Some 4 million volumes were expunged in a matter of a couple of years under the guise of written uh, write-off, you know, in library, li libraries you write off a certain amount, like 1% of your library uh, collection every year because of uh, being used too much or just not being lent to make space for, for new books. And this was sort of massive expunging of books. Um, and then also that liberty taken by people to expunge libraries was also the liberty to loot uh, Serbian minority or to kill even people. So uh, we wanted to commemorate war in that kind of way. Okay, so I, we can go back to this. And I would now like to uh, sort of finish off uh, in reflecting a bit about the politics of uh, memory of the world. Um, in the day and age when the market forces rule uncontest, uncontested and everything can be enclosed, piracy had demonstrated that the politicization can happen not by alternative approaches to creating new, but rather by organizing the straightforward way of breaking the old. By stopping the full flow of capital, by abolishing the property form, by, by occupying, by stealing. Piracy is one of the few ways how we can effectively politicize the context. Fundamental to any politicization that starts with an intervention such as stealing is however, that it is followed and supported by a clear articulation expressing in the language of society, the larger implications of that intervention. In our case, we consider digital piracy as an effective way of upending the exclusions of intellectual property, an intervention that can be done by modest means to great effect, but one that we think is equally necessary in all domains of human well-being, where property form creates exclusions and asymmetries in work, housing, healthcare, yeah, yet where it might be much harder to do uh, such an intervention to overturn things. <clears throat> so it is the articulation that situates our intervention into a larger political imaginary of society. We've been trying to articulate uh, that politics uh, through two notions. One is disobedience and the other one is uh, care or custodianship. In the background, you can see uh, a letter that a bunch of us uh, shadow librarians have penned uh, in 2015 when Elsevier uh, sued uh, Science Hub and uh, Library Genesis expressing our um, solidarity and, and support for their work. Uh, letter that we have titled Custodians uh, Online. In the letter, we have tried to articulate both a politics of mass disobedience and a politics of inversion of property into a politics of care. So I'll, I'll just read a little bit from, from this letter. Consider Elsevier, the largest scholarly publisher whose 37% margin stands in sharp contrast to the rising fees expanding student loan debt and poverty level wages for adjunct faculty. Elsevier owns some of the largest databases of academic material, which are licensed at, at prices so scandalously high that even Harvard, the richest university of the global north, has complained that it cannot afford them any longer. This is the other side of that 37% profit, uh, profit margin. Our knowledge commons grows in the fault lines of a broken system. We are all custodians of knowledge, custodians of the same infrastructures that we depend on for producing knowledge, custodians of our fertile but fragile commons. To be custodian is de facto to download, to share, to read, 
to write, to review, to edit, to digitize, to archive, to maintain libraries, to make them accessible. It is to be of use to and not to make property of our knowledge commons. Shadow libraries thus perform an inversion that replaces the ability of ownership to exclude with the practice of custodianship, notion implying both the labor of preservation of cultural art artifacts, such as in museums, and the most menial and invisible labor of daily maintenance and cleaning of physical structures. Um, so it is these two, the, the uh, inversion of property and the practice of custodianship that, uh, oh, sorry, let me take that again. Shadow libraries thus perform an inversion that replaces the ability of ownership to, ex to exclude with the practice of custodianship that makes one useful to a resource held in common and the infrastructures that sustain it. In the words of the little prince that we mobilize in this letter, so the letter is opening with this uh, simile, um, little prince meets, that's an episode from, uh, from the little prince, he meets a businessman who accumulates stars and uh, little prince is uh, bemused, um, startled uh, by, by this fact that somebody would accumulate stars. And he says, I only uh, own a flower, uh, which uh, I water every day. And he owns uh, three volcanoes, which he cleans every week. And goes on to say, it is of some use to my volcanoes. And it is of some use to my flower that I own them. Uh, but you are of no use to the stars that you own. Um, so. This is the inversion that we've been trying to articulate, you know, from, from property to uh, care. And uh, that inversion can happen only through disobedience. Maybe I will stop here um, and we can discuss more um, in whichever direction you feel uh, we should take this uh, conversation. Thank you very much, Tomislav. <clears throat> If you would like to ask your questions, please raise your hand, or you can also write it on the chat. I'm going to try to see everyone as a gallery. <clears throat> uh, maybe, maybe I go ahead. I, I just wanted to ask one question, uh, Tomislav, uh, about uh, some of the articles that you have written or co-written with Marcel Mars, you are mentioning uh, the judiciary process about intellectual copyrights, and then you're using, um, uh, you're 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 arguing that <clears throat> the land property laws are actually used in the cases of intellectual copyright and infringement infringement. So I just wanted to ask you if you could elaborate on that court process a little bit about copyright infringement or in the case of library new, for example. So the land property is more of a metaphor the way we feel uh, that uh, intellectual production is organized uh, through you know, a kind of, um, obviously uh, property of a land is just a form, specific form of, uh, uh, property regulation, um, intellectual uh, creation has uh, some specificities of its own, and uh, uh, this is more just to um, um, for the point of argument, for the sake of argument, that we uh, insist on that. Though we don't wouldn't say that uh, uh, they are equal. Uh, it's just that that property form emerged. Uh, in the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Mm. This is also when uh, the regulation of uh, books as sort of cultural commodity, first form of cultural commodity uh, is uh, emerging. It's emerging uh, um, through very specific circumstances of uh, early capitalism. Uh, it has also its liberatory aspects insofar as it allows, market allows for some autonomy from, for, from patronage. 
um, but uh, in many ways, it also creates uh, author function, reinforces author function, uh, organizes uh, cultural economy in a sp specific way that we kind of still have today. And this is why we kind of wield that uh, metaphor to kind of uh, uh, emphasize the historical moment of uh, its emergence and why we think that uh, digital networks have provided an opportunity or at least an occasion to maybe reconsider how uh, culture uh, is produced in society and primarily how knowledge is produced in a society and why uh, it need not be regulated by a uh, commodity form, but uh, should be socialized. No, that's kind of the political argument behind this. Um, and then uh, the act of uh, stealing a book is also uh, an act of liberating it from its commodity form, which creates a separation in the world of knowledge. Um, that would be kind of the predominant politics behind this, but we kind of are interested in also larger uh, politics of uh, production of knowledge and also other elements of social reproduction as I've uh, uh, mentioned toward the end of my talk. Um, as concerns the lawsuits, um, they are sort of a reality in the world of uh, shadow libraries. No, many were shut down. I mentioned just two. Uh, um, there is a case against ARG ongoing. Um, and uh, obviously, larger shadow libraries such as Library Genesis and uh, Science Hub are under a constant uh, barrage of, of uh, legal uh, threats. And um, we think uh, one way to take this is to avoid uh, the whole story, to try to operate in the gray zone as we frequently are forced to um, and facing up to the forms of domination uh, usually does not work. So sometimes operating in the cracks or operating uh, outside of uh, legible space of legality or an illegality makes sense. No, um, we can uh, thank uh, the continued existence of Science Hub only to the fact that servers in uh, Russia are sort of outside of reach of uh, global copyright enforcement, mm. um, and um, they can take down their uh, domain names, which they've been doing uh, with increasing pace. And they, and as you, if you use Science Hub or Library Genesis, you are already well well versed in uh, seeking out what's the new domain name uh, every couple Life of months. Day. Yeah, um, and. Uh, so that's a reality and uh, nothing is forever. We have to build a resilience if we want these infrastructures to exist so that they are not dependent on centralized servers. But the problem is that uh, World Wide Web is the most accessible technology out there. Uh, and uh, if you go to, into the dark net, as uh, Alexander Albakian says, uh, then accessibility is severely diminished for many people in the world who don't master necessarily the tools to go into the dark net or search uh, internet beyond World Wide Web. Um, and uh, sort of our concern with memory of the world has been articulating that uh, conflict around the digital world as uh, not conflict over access to information, but uh, as a conflict uh, over access to social goods, uh, sort of as a material uh, conflict uh, when blown out to uh, the scale of uh, the world economy or the world system, capitalist world system and uneven development. Um, we've been doing that through many public formats. We've done a lot of exhibitions and uh, conferences 
we even had uh, we wanted to do a show trial of ourselves once but uh, somehow it didn't come together we thought that that would be kind of a a good way to uh, open up the debate you know that uh, it's obviously uh, that um, that it might come to that and then uh, preempting that and having a, a meaningful public uh, argument um, and um, uh, trying to get support behind is, is sort of uh, what makes sense. I think Alexander Albakian is doing it sort of for real and um, um, it made no sense to kind of pursue it uh, as, as sort of a, 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 um, sort of show trial uh, but yeah that's that's the story there um, we have one question from Maltam who wrote to chat to everyone uh, I'm gonna read it Maltam in case uh, you want to read it yourself please let me know mm -hmm. otherwise I'll just read it um, Maltam says thank you very much one question Memory of the world emphasizes access, but is devoid of the particularity of space. It is somewhat abstract, but care is particular, like flowering a flower. How do memory of the world and care relate to each other? Well, um, I might go back to librarians because they are, in that sense, carers uh, um, in, in the memory of the world. Uh, conceptual um, um, sort of topology. Um, so there is one person who's responsible for 50 to 60,000 uh, books out of 150, 160 uh, that exist there. And that one person um, lives in a specific place of the world, uh, uh, has committed himself uh, to uh, doing this as an act of uh, uh, self-care uh, and uh, in a way that work for a period of time was really sustaining him and we, we try to sustain him in, 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 in that kind of work. Um, so I think that these situations are really, in that sense, um, uh, specific, they are uh, access is general. No internet, we tend to think of as being generally accessible in a similar kind of way. Though we know that that's highly skewed um, from place to place uh, around the world, and that we need to use different tools to uh, access uh, internet where where it's not uh, um, available in, in its entirety and its rarely is. Uh, so um, that that already kind of uh, is a specific uh, geography of uh, access, uh, but fundamentally for us is like uh, who's the librarian? What is the collection? As I've sh shown you, collections are very specific. Um, for instance, that one librarian, he was really uh, focused on trying to get those books that people asked for uh, in the collection. Uh, he would meticulously prepare them. Uh, he would sometimes have a batch of 16 books that would uh, be on the splash page of the memory of, uh, of the world because he didn't like the, the selection of another uh, librarian. So kind of there is a specificity to all that. Um, and obviously the ultimate specificity is that uh, the space of regulation is, is um, uh, ordered uh, and uh, that makes us vulnerable in that sense. No? Um, so the work of care uh, in these instances is also a work of uh, disobedience. It entails a lot of risk. Uh, and uh, that risk is particular. You kind of play around that risk. Obviously, no, you want to have your server there where it won't be taken down uh, uh, quickly. But uh, so I don't know if that answers. Um, um, as you know, we've done with Valeria a project that focuses very specifically on uh, 
situated knowledges of collective organizing of care, uh, particularly there where they are contesting legal regimes, et cetera, et cetera. So they kind of deal with this issue more explicitly, but uh, uh, memory of the world uh, kind of has this specificity in uh, that which librarians bring uh, and their collections, their sort of uh, specific situations and the reasons behind them. Thank you. Any, <clears throat> any other questions from you? I see a hand, Bacon, please go ahead. Yes, thanks and hi from Slav. Hey, Bacon. Uh, good to see you yeah. again. Uh, uh, thanks for this uh, discussion. I, I have, um, I don't know if it's a real question, but uh, I was wondering, um, yeah, I do agree with you, like stealing a book as in a way decommodifying it. And I was very happy to see my book uh, scanned and, and uh, shared on arc.org. I was very honored, you know, uh, but, then, <laughs> but then I was thinking, uh, yes, it's, you know, uh, because, because the, I, actually the publisher never gave me a PDF of my book. So I was very happy to have, receive it. <laughs> but in the sense I thought, yeah, but the, but the order has a different relationship with, the, with, the, with her own production. I'm not requiring a sort of like a pavement, but uh, a gift or something like that, as something that could be recipro in reciprocity, uh -huh. that the order uh, is somehow is included in the process. Uh, I'm so glad that the journals, uh, you know, are being punished or forced to renew themselves. But what about the orders? Like, what do we do with them and or for them or together? Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I guess there is no easy answer to that uh, because people feel differently about uh, their works uh, uh, being made accessible. Um, making accessible is in a way practice uh, uh, against economic regulation of uh, access and uh, that obviously has implications on, on authors. And authors, again, have uh, moral rights uh, that they might uh, want to exercise. And obviously they have sort of uh, need to have some control over, over uh, what they do in the world and, and how that uh, is uh, taken further. Um, we've done, uh, so we've been asked very frequently a uh, similar type of question, not relating to authors, but relating to communities that want to keep their most indigenous knowledge uh, inaccessible. Um, and our answer to that is obviously, you no, know, you need to do politics with whatever tools you've uh, and means you've got. So if it's copyright, uh, use copyright for, for your political struggle. But the problem is that with uh, using copyright, you are immediately falling, falling with your work within um, uh, the structure of commodity relations. Uh, and uh, they play out in, in the largest sense. So there is no immediate gift other than the gift of other books that you receive, I think, um, that might be acceptable or an acceptable, uh, inacceptable gift, but um, we see sort of authorship in direct relation to that uh, um, commodity structure, commodification structure, and uh, um, that can't be squared. You know, like you have, you got to break some eggs, I think, in, in that kind of respect. But um, uh, we frequently do work with authors to get their books out. That's uh, more frequently uh, the case than uh, vice versa. As for communities, we also uh, do help them digitize and not publish. Uh, to authors, we also help uh, digitize and not publish if that's particularly what they want, uh, but um, we see kind of that differently you now. Um, with the uh, with memory of, with the pirate care, we've been developing uh, a technological framework uh, 
uh, of collective writing and publishing uh, that works uh, on the foundation of, an, of a collection. It can be an archive, it can be a collection of books, uh, it can be uh, a collection of um, documents if you're, I don't know, social justice movement and you have some documents that you would like to organize. Uh, and then right on top of that, uh, we call that framework standpoints. Um, and there we have made it so that you can do everything offline, uh, maintaining it offline, writing it offline, sharing it offline, uh, with the specific idea that uh, some people might want to organize their learning processes and their publications in clandestine, in clandestine or um, uh, I don't know, or work off the grid, et cetera, et cetera. But these are conceptual ideas. Um, no one has used them so far, so I don't know what's there. Um, um, what are the consequences of, of uh, pursuing that kind of uh, uh, limitation of uh, access? But we understand that there, there are politics that necessitate that and that uh, some uh, communities might want to uh, pursue that now, uh, and still use technology to uh, regulate that sharing. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, anybody else have questions? If not, uh, I think Zeno has a few words for closing. Thank you, um, Tomisal. I was sort of like, while listening to you connecting um, two things that when you said Shadow Libraries has a collection of 2 million books compared to Google having 4 million, this 14. 14. 40. Four, 40. Okay. I, I heard 400. Yeah. Anyway, nowadays. like when compared to their profit, like it's really hard to understand why they are still, uh, they are still trying to like take down all this, um, all the shadow libraries, but also we always feel it inside the social movements as well. Like we are so small. We don't believe that we are doing anything, but the oppression is still there. So it was somewhat like connected to that, like make a president of that this disobedience doesn't grow. And um, like something really stuck with me reading your article, maybe um, I would like to finish with that if you have um, some words on it, where you say where law was, their politics shall be. So this relationship with law and politics, um, that, that was one of the sentences stuck with me. So I just wanted to finish with that. Thank you. Yeah, th that was basically the argument that uh, we wanted to politicize uh, copyright regulation and that uh, things that get handled through the binary of legal and illegal need to be discussed through the binary of legitimate and illegitimate. And uh, uh, it's in the political terrain where this is fought. No? Um, that's, that, that was kind of the, the point that we were trying to make with uh, that uh, uh, rephrasing of, of Freud. No? So, if there are no other questions. Thank you for joining us, Tomislav. Thank you for your time. Thanks for everyone else for joining us as well. Uh, our next talk will be in a few weeks on the 7th of January. We all invite you. It's going to be with two people again, Athena Athanasiu and Elena Tsevipis. And uh, this talk will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, this talk with Tom Stahl will be on our YouTube channel soon as well. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank evening, Thomas Love. Thank See you, you Thomas Love. Happy holidays. And, uh, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a nice sounding word. No, yeah. almost, uh, no vowels in it. Yeah. <laughs> we have a couple of those, like which means yeah. blunt. <laughs> Okay.
Have a lovely All right. Evening. Take care and uh, love so, to Michael and his family. Yeah. Take care. I'll let him know. Thank you.